Hello everyone and a jolly good afternoon. It's good to see you all here. Uh, I'm Raymond Bleischwitz. I'm professor in sustainable global resources and I'm director of the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources. And the reason why uh, we are here is the hackathon, uh, Climate Solutions in a Time of Pandemic. We are here to celebrate the winners. So again, congratulations to all winners. And indeed, we are here to discuss how eventually these great ideas could be taken forward. Uh, let me just perhaps summarize of why we did the hackathon. It has indeed been related to the pandemic. When the pandemic kicked in and half of the world actually started going into shutdown, we thought we should try to create a space uh, with the ability to look forward, to generate new ideas, ideas about what we consider important too, which is climate change and climate action, and ways of how eventually some of the experience that people have been gaining throughout the pandemic can be used to then unleash a green recovery. So that was the idea. We did set up, uh, set up the website. We looked for mentors, participants, judges. We made it. So thank you. We had almost 200 participants. My impression has been that we had a share of people from across our school, our faculty and UCL. So that's been great. But we also had participants from uh, essentially all other continents. So the 35, 36 teams, 37 actually, teams that worked together were actually comprised of novel teams with a diverse background typically not having met before. So I really appreciate the uh, spirit of entrepreneurial thinking and adventure of bringing it all together. We were quite pleased then to see the submissions. We had a couple of hours with all judges to discuss, possibly in depth, because all judges really took their time to look at these submissions. And then indeed, are now happy to celebrate the winners. Why those winners, why not others, you may ask. And indeed, it's fair to say that all submissions basically have been great. We nevertheless thought that the biking in London idea, which you'll see in a minute, is an idea that is really important for the transformation that we need in mobility. And seeing three excellent submissions indeed, in a way, helped us uh, and stimulated us to say, why don't these three teams just share the award? So that was our number one choice. But indeed, there is also a wider setting, um, well, a wider setting about like greening the cities, food chains, and this is what the other awards are about. So I'm really quite pleased seeing the teams represented here in the afternoon and the idea of how we thought we could run this event now is as follows. The number one teams will have some 15 minutes. Remember, it's three teams coming together. And the slides are already in the background. And I also see Josie more or less ready to go with a presentation. So we will have some 15 minutes of slides followed by Q&A. Q&A comes through this webinar style of you, whoever is interested in raising a question, articulating something, use please the Q&A function, which you will see at the bottom of your slide. What is it exactly that you would like to tease out of our competent audience here? First, it is some, well, feedback. Whatever you think this team really has done great, please feel free to articulate it. And then indeed, second, the hope would very much be that either some ongoing research project might be, might offer an open door to any of those or parts of the project, or there might be some ongoing proposal writings, or you might be aware of some relevant activities and name, where again, you can either use the Q&A function or just drop an email. So by these mechanisms, we would very much encourage you to help our winners to well move on with those great ideas. That's it, I would say from my side. 
I'm ready to hand over the microphone now to Asas. I may ask Theo first. Is there anything that I might have left out in how we run the show this afternoon, Theo? Uh, no, I think you more or less uh, said everything. Firstly, the three teams will uh, present uh, for about 15 minutes. Then we have the 10-minute uh, uh, questions. You can type your questions in the Q&A on the bottom uh, right uh, of your uh, screen of Zoom. And then we will have the second place uh, team uh, uh, five minutes presentation followed by questions and the same for the third. Unfortunately, the third team doesn't have a representative today, so I will quickly go through their uh, slides, uh, but that will come later. And uh, yes, we can uh, start now with uh, Josie. Jay London, Josie and Asus, please feel also free to say just a second. Um, well, a little bit about yourself and then kick it off. So, Josie, over to you now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for organizing this and attending this. My name is Josie, or JN, my Chinese name, if you, as you may know me by that. Um, I'm a master's student at Bartlett School of Planning. I do the infrastructure planning appraisal and development course. And here I have one of my teammates, Lou, who is also on the panel. And unfortunately, Lucas, our third teammate, can't join us today, but he's the two of us and we have two other teams in this joint presentation. Hi, um, I'm Kasia. I'm from um, the NSC Behaviour Change. Um, I'm part of the Planeteers group uh, along with uh, other co-presenter today, uh, Alex. There was actually um, six of us overall though, so there's quite a lot more of us in the team. Um, we're all from a behaviour change uh, background in, as part of PALS. Uh, hi, I'm Tishan from Social Movements, um, where I personally am a student from the Transport City Planning Program at the Bartlett School, along with uh, three other teammates, two of which are from the same program and the another from the MRES program as well. Uh, they're not here, to, but some of them are here to watch. So, Perfect. If we go to the next slide. Um, we've identified three barriers to cycling in London across all of our three presentations and here I'm going to introduce the first one because that's the one our group originally focused on which is social exclusion and um, by social exclusion we mean it in many dimensions and aspects one of them what we focused on was the disparity in gender so as you can see in the pie chart on the bottom right of the slide um, the major majority of cyclists in London are male and it's very intuitive when you think about if half the population isn't cycling as much as the other half, the whole um, campaign of promoting cycling across society is ineffective. So in order to make that more effective, we thought it might be worth targeting social groups that are currently excluded from the mainstream image of cycling. And in that, we've identified some more specific um, issues, such as lack of confidence and lack of um, competence, which could be resolved, which um, with proposals we've later suggested. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll have, yes. So um, another barrier that um, all of our teams identified um, to cycling in London is that um, there is a lack of proper safety and infrastructure. Um, Pre-lockdown, three in five people in the UK thought that cycling on the road was too dangerous. Uh, a case study also found that six European cities um, that were safe, consistent and attractive cycling networks encouraging um, cycling much more. Um, and then less than 50% of cyclists gave a good rating to the availability of cycle lanes in the UK, I think that is. Um, but overall, a key barrier that we identified to cycling is the lack of proper infrastructure and a perceived lack of safety in cycling. If you can just go to the next slide. Um, another uh, barrier that we identified as a team is that London is experiencing 
bit of a gap between in, in investments and priorities between cycling and other modes of transport. So for example, in the UK and other European countries, uh, fiscal incentives such as tax subsidies for cycling are much lower at around 15% than out of uh, company cars, for example. In this, this case, we, we're just talking about the average because the UK and London fare worse than other more progressive European countries. So for example, as of 2015, 24 pounds are publicly invested per person annually uh, to boost cycling in the Netherlands, while in the UK it's at less than 10 pounds per head. Now the mayor of London and the UK government have been putting more effort into planning and investing into cycling. So we can actually take advantage of the recent two billion uh, pound investment, for example, committed by Prime Minister Boris Johnson to promote cycling and walking. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, pure investments into cycling does not necessarily encourage rapid demand for cycling if it is not well integrated with or prioritized with other uh, modes of transport. And next slide. So despite these barriers to cycling, um, because of coronavirus, public transport has been has seen a decrease in use um, as loads of people don't see it as safe anymore. So the UK has seen a major increase in cycling over this lockdown period. And so the general consensus among all three of us, um, all three teams, was that this presented a timely opportunity to engage people to cycle more, but also to maintain the, the cycling behaviour that has started because of lockdown. Um, which is, I guess, why we've all focused on this behavior over others. Next slide, please. So here we're kind of jumping into what the three teams each came up with before we combined our ideas. For us, we mainly focused on, as I said, encouraging cycling among women. So within that, we decided that there were three main aspects we could target in achieving their objective. So firstly was to overcome the lack of confidence. And secondly, we want to facilitate trips that women tend to make more, which are typically called trip chaining, which means making a series of short trips in a short period of time due to the kinds of roles and responsibilities women typically have in society. And thirdly, is more on an institutional level to resolve the disproportionate representation of women. And obviously, you can apply that to other kinds of social groups in the planning and de delivery of cycling infrastructure. Next slide, please. And within that, in the first point, to overcome the lack of confidence. Um, Lou, do you mind talking a bit about this one? Hi, I don't know if you can hear me, um, but we came up with bike user groups in the workplace, which can be a great, um, way of fostering a community among female cyclists um, and through bike user groups or bugs um, that can be a vehicle to deliver things like cycling with confidence courses so essentially cycle proficiency courses for adults um, you know facilitating um, skills like cycling in inclement weather conditions cycling with children specifically cycling commuting um, and we also propose company e-bike schemes um, aiming to replace short, dis relatively short distance urban commutes um, that are often done by company cars with e-bikes. Next slide, please. Um, and secondly, here we have how we want to facilitate trip chaining. And there are two ways we want to do this, Baya. One is, as you can see in the photo, ironically, it's ridden by a man um, but we want to try all these um, trolley fitted bikes which are very commonly found in some other places this photo I think it is from Copenhagen where lots of um, even um, children with their buggies and shopping and other belongings can fit in the trolley and it takes burden off the cyclists who would otherwise find it very difficult to carry um, and will opt for other modes of transport instead. Um, aside from that, we thought it might be helpful to integrate the current Santander cycles with the hopper fare that's um, implemented on London bus services. So with, uh, I think it's £1.50, you can tap as many times as you want within a certain time period. And if you integrate that with bikes, people might be able to bus, bike, walk, and um, 
paying up their trips to facilitate the kinds of journeys they'd like to make. Next slide, please. And thirdly, this is, on a, as I said, on a more institutional level, to represent the needs and wants of women more in the kinds of planning and um, govern governance levels in London. This might be through councils, local boroughs, um, even as high as the GLA, that's Greater London Authority, um, as well as through cycling bodies. So there are more um, cultural groups within society that are usually dominated by men because of how cycling is typically or historically convened, um, considered as a sport. Um, and within all of those bodies, it's in a collective effort to make transport planning more inclusive and to make women's needs more reflected in the kinds of processes that go on within the planning and appraisal process. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting my thing up. Um, so I'm now going to go through our solution um, as part of the Plan Clears team. Uh, we developed a behaviour change intervention focused on community engagement to encourage and maintain cycling in London. Uh, this included community events, um, paint uh, cycling cycle path, implementing bicycle barometers and painting safety nudges on cycling paths, which um, we're all going to go into more detail now. If you can go to the next slide. So um, for our solution, um, the first part of our intervention will engage the community in painting the cycling path in their own neighbourhoods. We've got a couple of mock-up examples here. Um, the local artists will be commissioned to work on the project and members of the community will be asked to volunteer to come and actually paint their own cycle path. Um, that would be tailored to the location kind of unique style um, whilst also following a lot of um, safety guidelines to avoid it being too distracting. Um, one idea is that people would be interested to go around and see the different art paths around London as they'd all be different neighbourhoods. Um, the one example we've got here is of Shoreditch um, and you can just see it there that it's a kind of urban art concept because there's so much you know local graffiti art around Shoreditch that could be one example. Um, so overall this uses a participatory approach to painting cycle paths as a way to engage the community, uh, increase acceptance and awareness of cycling and cycle paths and creating a positive social norm that cycling is for everyone whilst also being quite aesthetically pleasing and you know physically drawing your attention to them. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so our second uh, component was adding these bicycle barometers which we've kind of we've taken from uh, uh, pictures in other cities like uh, Copenhagen are already using them um, and we are um, planning to improve the design and as we have here um, but what these barometers do is that they tally daily and annual um, cyclists and this is an effective behavioural trace indicator so that means that people who are passing by that road with the barometer can see how many cyclists have been on that road and this promotes a positive social norm that people are cycling more um, which would encourage more to cycle. Um, next slide please. And the second, well the third um, component is to just deal with a fast um, cycling culture. Uh, so a lot of people think that um, it's too dangerous because there is, there's a lot of uh, fast cyclists on the roads. Um, so this, intervent this component would, um, first, of it, first of all, widen the cycle lanes so that you know, more cyclists can be on the same road without being too near to each other. And also adding speed strips like in the pictures shown there. Um, this basically increases the perception that you're going fast, which would make you slow down a bit and therefore would um, make people slow down and decrease the perception that is dangerous. Um, next slide, please.
Yep. And for the proposal for social movement is actually a much more general and comprehensive idea where we want cycling to expand as a solution for all mobility issues. So it's a cycling for, for everyone, everywhere and everything. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned by Jay London um, in, our previous in our previous analysis of current issues of cycling in London, uh, we see that cycling is actually not as popular amongst women and definitely not convenient or available as a choice for seniors and people with physical limitations. So to tackle this issue, we have a variety of solutions, a couple of which um, Lou and Josie actually already mentioned. So for example, we propose for e-bike grants that can subsidize e-bike purchases or encourage e-bike sharing, um, especially for senior citizens or partially handicapped groups. Uh, for many of the aforementioned demographics, some of their prime concerns are safety. So we're calling for cycle training and mentoring so Londoners can drive in, in seemingly busy roads with, with confidence. And for the everyday commuter who may find cycling in the morning um, uncertain or a bit of a bother, we can further incentivize companies to reward commuters and provide amenities in their workplace to facilitate their cycling habits. Throughout all these uh, type of solutions, we hope to answer uh, different concerns of different groups, demographics. Next slide. Our group also saw that the bicycle is used mainly in the inner London area, but barely in the outer London area, most likely due to a sparser land use and priority for the automobile over the bicycle. So in this case, we believe that we can take good advantage of London's well-connected public transport system and integrate them with cycling to complete journeys um, to or within outer London so that cycling can be for everywhere. So this idea is actually, um, was mostly inspired by um, the cycle renting program across the Netherlands and the massive parking facilities in Dutch train stations that allow people to commute or travel intercity without the need of a car. So long distance travel is possible with bicycle or bicycle with something else. Um, this idea can be implemented in London where the transition between cycling and public transport can be swift as possible providing more cycle parking and bike sharing in or near tube and train stations. If we get Oyster Cards for Santander cycle hiring programs as well, uh, this could be a uh, much more convenient way of traveling or more um, uh, good for, for everybody's budget. Furthermore, the area that the Santander Cycle Hire Program services shall expand beyond the central London area to the rest of inner London and eventually to, to all of outer London so that Londoners have access to, to bicycle for their, especially for the first and last miles of the trips or even just a quick ride to the shops. Um, and most importantly, I think we can, we, we believe that we can take advantage of the high streets scattered across London, even um, in outer London, and ensure that they provide more of our necessity necessities such as shopping, uh, leisure, or work to reduce the need to travel far in the first place. Uh, many of London's high streets are accessible for many homes within 50 minutes by bike and when we add e-bikes to the equation we expand these services service areas even further so that we can have more certain and equitable accessibility for more demographics. Uh, next slide. And finally, we see a potential in expanding cycling beyond movement of people, but also to movement of goods. And that, that's something that we uh, tend to forget about when we plan cities. Um, so again, we use e-bikes that can help with uh, relieving congestion, optimizing logistics for smaller, more personal pieces of cargo that can remove a lot of the trucks and lorries or lorries from, from uh, the, the roads. Uh, these include e-deliveries from Amazon. Um, Curbside spaces should be given to last mile cargo bike deliveries or bikes can deliver into a from or to a centralized delivery drop off or pick off pickup location to reduce again truck or lorry related congestion and public transport can also be used for cargo delivery and actually surprisingly we already use some of that in London, but we can expand that for um, other off peak hours um, and integrate that with cargo bikes as again a form of last mile transport. Uh, next slide. And all in all, our vision of cycling for everyone, everywhere, and everything seeks to resolve the current overcrowding and unsafe issues on London's highways and public transport system, which are now magnified um, exponentially in during the COVID-19 pandemic. So our comp comprehensive solution combats all three of the barriers that we've mentioned for a more human scale and cyclable London. 
right. You realize the clock is ticking a bit. Um, I think we've got about five more minutes. I think we were to told something between 15 and 20. Uh, we've got about three more slides if you're happy with that. Just go. Cool. Um, so we are just going to talk briefly about um, how we combine these a little bit more. Um, overall, across the three teams, we found that although we use different frameworks and came from different backgrounds of research, we found that our comp ideas complemented each other quite well. Um, and they were all contributing a useful view on the problem um, we're facing with getting more people to cycle. Um, so on the left of this slide is just as an example um, of this, uh, it's the COMBI model, which is a behavior change model from our team. Um, and uh, it basically helps us understand the drivers and barriers to cycling behavior. Uh, in brief, it's an overarching model that sees behavior as um, influenced by a person's capability, motivation, opportunity. Um, so this is just really one example of where as students coming from different disciplines, we could integrate theories and research to produce uh, a shared understanding of how we might tackle the problem. Um, something that is equally important though, is when we're working across disciplines, um, it's making sure that we all hold the same vision, which on the right is a good example of how all of our solutions kind of work to this one everywhere, every, everyone and everything um, shared vision uh, about getting more people to cycle. So uh, next slide, please. And the general flow of how uh, our ideas will go together is that um, with so our social movements, more general ideas for cycling, that can act as more we want to use that as the motivation and also the end goal of uh, a more cyclable London. So for example, we can take Planeteer's more uh, community participation and uh, Jay London's uh, need for more safe spaces, especially for women, to not only be act as the motivation or rationale behind all of this, but also to use it as a major strategy to make sure that cycling in London is real truly for everyone, everywhere and everything. We want more comprehensive solutions, not uh, end of the pipe um, solutions that, you know, has to change every now and then. We want something more concrete so then we can have um, citywide cycling and also and most importantly cycling for women and hopefully finally just uh as, as our final goal and hopefully expand those goals goals even more to the future uh next slide and as we can see here we actually put all our interventions into the different categories so we actually have a lot of very detailed ones of course i'm not going to go through all of them um, but there's actually a plethora of ways that uh, we can use cycling to target social inequities and lack of safety and low priorities over other forms of transport and cycle, cycling. So all in all, that can make cycling in London more inclusive, safer, and easier for everyone. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. Well, thank you. And thanks to the entire team. I really think that has been great. The floor is now open for Q&A. So I'm waiting for people to type in some feedback, eventually a question, but especially also some ideas of how those ideas could be brought forward. And while people might just still think through the Q&A, I would also like to give a quick feedback from my side. I think it's really important to start addressing barriers as you do it. They are typically on a number of levels, as you point out. I was really impressed to see the behavioral approach to all of it, because quite often we think of it in terms of, say, technologies and some support through policy making. So you really have a strong emphasis on the different levels of behavioral issues. That's been great. And also like how you then, after presenting a couple of very tangible solutions, you also then try to pull it together in an effort to make it part of a more comprehensive strategy where indeed the transportation of goods or the overall mobility strategy comes into play. So that's, that's really a much appreciated step from your side, recognizing that you well, had been three 
actually three competing teams a while ago. So thank you. Is there anything coming up in the Q&A? Uh, do you see anything? Okay. Would be good to link up. Ian Scott, yes. So thanks, Ian. Ian is from the UCL Grand Challenges. So it is definitely a useful contact, if I may say so, Ian. So that's great. Uh, can the presentation be shared, sent by email? I ask the authors, probably yes, I guess. We should be able to upload the presentation also on the Bartlett web, uh, Bartlett Hack website. Uh, and I very much hope that will be available well to all participants or others who are interested. Also, the presentation is recorded and uh, an email will be sent around, so you will be able to rewatch it if you'd like. Uh, we will indeed also make an effort to make it available well, to a wider audience, of course. I see Ian also confirming that he's still with UCI and Grand Challenges, so waving my hand, I haven't seen you for a while. Um, anything else that is coming up? Uh, or Theo, would you have any thought or anything else from participants? Uh, the only thing uh, that uh, strikes me a little bit is that uh, you did collaborate, I guess, in the end, and your presentation more or less makes sense. I don't know how much you actually communicated with each other, but uh, I, I think that's really commendable and it makes sense. <laughs> Uh, two steps that I would like to do also myself and no one minds and objects is we do have this fantastic mass lab group and some of you might have had a chance to collaborate with Manas who is like one of the senior guys in this mobility as a services team. So I would like to make one more step to get you in touch with this group. I understand some of them had tried to attend today but it's summertime and we wanted to do it as rapidly as possible. So. I, do another loop of, uh, of, of bringing these ideas into their agenda. And I would also think that indeed we have some context to transport for London. One would think there should be someone available who is like uh, quite willing to listen to all these great ideas because it is on the agenda. And I'm pretty sure there are some people who are at least in general interested taking a closer look then. Anything else? There was a answered more things coming up. Ian, yes, there has been a suggestion. Theo, would you like to read it? Yes, Ian, uh, Scott. Ian just said, uh, with uh, UCL Health uh, of the Public, Sarah Welsher, in context of bikes prescribed by GPS to counteract obesity epidemic. Uh, all right, that's fine. I would say thank you. We have one more presentation to go and I would like to invite the next presenters then to uh, enter the scene. Please, would you introduce yourself then? Hello there, um, my name is Helen Carter and I'm from the M-Plan City Planning course. So it's quite a co cohesive two-year programme. Um, all of our team Repeat the Street are from the M-Plan City Plan. We have different backgrounds, but we're all doing that master's programme and I will be presenting with Sika. Hi, I'm City Plan from Upland City Planning as well. And Kulkaran. Hi, I'm Kulkaran from M Plan as well. Okay, perfect. Can we have, um, so the first thing we wanted to do was to just briefly explain how we work together as a team. So obviously we spent like the first like day or so coming up with ideas and we were very animated and create and sort of excited by the prospect and we were coming up with lots of ideas, but it also meant that it was quite hard to focus. Um, but I do feel like having that more relaxed structure and mind mapping meant that we were able to explore lots of different avenues and ideas fully. Um, also working together in a team is quite difficult online. And I think this is, it's really interesting and important to look at that looking forward in COVID. Um, so normally we would have liked to mind map on a big sheet of paper with pens, um, and it's quite hard to get creative when staring at a screen. So we decided to take like regular breaks from the video calls so that each member had time to think creatively offline. Um, so going forward, as I said, we realized that we're gonna have to do a lot of more teamwork and mind mapping sessions online. So maybe having some sort of software that we could use to physically do that on the screen would be quite interesting to look forward. Um, so the first slide, 
We're just talking about a bit about kind of what inspired our idea. So we kind of were looking at responses to COVID and seeing what community and and different et, like neighbourhoods had done in response to COVID. And a lot of people had put out cones, especially in like the Barnes area and Hackney, to widen footpaths so that people and communities could like safely pass. Um, so it was interesting to see how like communities were definitely taking matters in to their own hands um, and we wanted to build on this sort of very active engagement of communities and this move towards hyper local decision making and make those sort of small term very like immediate responses more long-term lasting changes that would benefit the environment and be a response to climate change so we were also inspired by neighborhood plans um, sort of this idea of localism and how we could use this government agenda for localism to actually implement something that's quite positive um, and also wider civil society movement so you can see with um, the photo on the left hand side this kind of like movement towards promoting pedestrianization and like getting green sort of like small green spaces in your local streets um, so kind of we drew on those kind of ideas and also um it, similarly to the group before they talked about the 15 minute neighborhood and we were looking actually the 20 minute city in melbourne so they basically highlighted about 12 different like strategic movements that need or strategic decisions that need or areas that need to be targeted in order to create a 20 minute neighborhood so our our idea generally focused on like four of those um aspects and that was like safer streets and um easier walking spaces and places for play so next slide please so our project aims to digitalize democratic process to make it more accessible to the wider community uh there will be online elections for street committees who will then draft proposals of the changes that uh, they want to see in their own street uh, the proposals will be then submitted to the website uh, that we have proposed, uh, as you can see on uh, the left hand side of your screen. Um, to make sure that all processes are transparent, uh, street committee meetings uh, will be open for public and there will also be feedback questionnaires to ensure accountability of the whole process. Now, uh, uh, the feed on the street plan is located uh, below the neighborhood plan in the planning system. Uh, we uh, we make sure that this could be a representation at a hyper local planning level, uh, and also uh, it is uh, to encourage uh, more representation in a wider political system. Uh, we can also uh, say that the project itself is uh, a vehicle for representation because there has uh, been similar funding available for a hyper local planning level. Uh, and it also fits into the wider agenda of localism that uh, the government is uh, promoting. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so I'm just going to talk about the design interventions that can be implemented through our proposal feed on the street. Uh, so basically, through our proposal, we give the citizens an opportunity to be able to participate and collaborate and uh, design the kind of spaces that they would like to have in their neighborhood. Uh, so for this, we've taken the example of Purcell Street, which was uh, basically a local high street in the London borough of Hackney uh, with low to medium rise residential development units and uh, a lot of on street car parking on either side of the street and uh, basically not many open spaces. So um, the uh, so we've shown the kind of design interventions that can be done um, on the image. So uh, these include basically widening the pavements, reducing the number of car parking spaces and converting them into parklets, which can can be used as uh, standing spaces or seating spaces or they can be used as green open areas and uh, we can also include um, biodiversity by basically having pocket parks or planted pots or having uh, other planters which can also be used for seating and we also thought of having like cumulative uh, gathering spaces at the ends of the streets which could be used um, by the local businesses um, as spill out spaces or they can be used to put market uh, stools or kiosks during the weekend and uh, they can also be used by as seating spaces by the cafeterias or the bars and they can be used as play areas by children and we could also uh, have play equipment which can be stored on the street during the week uh, in storage spaces 
Uh, so basically, through our proposal, we hope that these uh, small scale uh, short term interventions can have uh, long term impacts of basically uh, moving away from a vehicular transportation and towards the 20 minute city model. So uh, and the cumulative uh, impact of uh, this kind of a proposal would be having a network of participating design streets, uh, which uh, have been designed through uh, feedback of people and active citizen participation and in, uh, by taking inspiration from other different streets uh, design wise and we could have social economic and environmental benefits. So the uh, key to success to basically our proposal fee on the street is the fact that it's a bottom up uh, democratic process uh, through citizen participation and it will lead to the continuous evolution of street design and, uh, and have basically familiar spaces which can be uh, used by the people. Thanks. That will be all. There we go. Well, thanks a lot to, to Helen and Kakaran Bedi and the entire team again. Uh, the floor is open. So you now know how to use the Q&A session. Please uh, type in any question, any feedback, any idea you may have. Uh, I'm using the minute the people now take to also thank you again in person. I think it's really great to see how precisely you have been targeting some of the boroughs throughout London like Hackney to make it a bit more tangible. And some of us might even have been there because it's also where here East is located. Uh, and indeed, it's also so interesting to see all the policy and governance approaches, the sort of bottom-up spirit that comes through it, and the mechanisms that you are defining. So that's all uh, well taken. I also like the feet on the street rhetoric. It's so much better than, say, boots on the ground that we know from some other context. So is there any uh, issue that might be raised here. Theo, do you see anything in the Q&A? No, uh, it's yeah. that people are shy or enjoying <laughs> the good weather. That probably is an indication of how much they're excited to see <laughs> what you have been pulling together. We may wait one more minute. I see a one coming up. That's there is one. Okay. Can we access the examples uh, later on the slides uh, yes uh, maya we will uh, send an email around with that and uh, also it's being recorded so you will be able to rewatch it so thank you that is much appreciated uh, okay, there more. is a question by yes, ian you can you read it yep mm -hmm. how do or will schemes like the 20 minute city ensure pedestrian safety more uh, and wider cycleways are and will be abused by furious cyclists, notably GIG economy riders. Gig economy riders. Um, I think the the main idea for our, like obviously cycleways was sort of a part of what we were trying to do, but I think mainly it was trying to, there's a, Oh, sorry. There's a policy um, process that's already in place where you can close off your street on a Sunday for like a couple of hours, basically. Um, and it's a very like, it's called play streets and it's a very long winded process and also not very well known. And I think more what we were trying to do was to sort of trial out pedestrianization in different streets. So it'd be like, okay, this street through your street on the street, on feet on the street plan, you can pedestrianize your street, say one day a week, or, or I don't know, uh, choose, I think it would be like on a Sunday or something like that to trial out what that looks like. Um, so I do think that was our sort of main focus was thinking about, I guess, safer streets, but in a sense of trying to stop them, like give space without vehicular traffic so that people could, and especially like children and younger groups could enjoy their like neighborhood streets and and that kind of thing. Um, I do agree that that is like an issue and obviously we would have to like work together with other interventions to try and get like a different behavior towards cycling. Um, but yeah, it's a good point, it's a good point. <laughs> We um, will also probably think of like a code of conduct that indeed yeah. the furious behavior should be like in a way penalized or yeah. negatively sanctioned. 
So more in a positive spirit indeed, and eventually also that the gig economy is somehow stabilized. So that it's not like the individual uh, motif to save your job by driving faster, but a support mm -hmm. mechanism and like a contractual arrangement where the gig economy is also part of a normal economy with some social support. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, great question. Great response, probably not the end of the story. I suggest we move on. We have one more presentation, one more winning team. And as Theo said at the beginning, he's going to share some slides from the idea about food system and what KTS Hacks wanted to do about it. Theo, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I mean, I will more or less be reading uh, the slides, but uh, of course you're, uh, you can do that uh, by yourselves as well. However, uh, this was a blockchain in the UK food system and supply chain by Charlie Langshaw, Alex Bowles and uh, Nicholas Bell. And uh, their proposal was in the food systems and supply uh, change um, for change. We, they suggested an innovative uh, use of an up and coming technology, which uh, could provide producers with the wide access to the market and increase sale of locally produced goods. And this technology is blockchain, which many of you might be obviously aware of, uh, which will promote the sale of uh, locally sourced food and move away from supermarket uh, dominance. Um, yes. So uh, nine companies, uh, sir, 94% of grocery supply in the UK as of uh, April this year. Uh, one of them is Tesco. I'm pretty sure you know which uh, at least four or five of the other ones are. And the independence, uh, independence only control 2.2, which I found actually surprising. I didn't know uh, it was only uh, that much. Uh, however, there was a slight increase of 0.6% since February, which is an indication of what this pandemic has also done. Uh, food is frequently wasted due to this uh, supermarket uh, monopoly, which is not surprise, uh, surprising. On average, 10 to 16% of uh, produce is uh, wasted every year. And since the supermarkets dictate the market uh, due to the reliance uh, that farmers have on the income from the supermarket giants uh, and the inflexible contracts they also impose, which maybe should, have, should change in the near future. So uh, cutting uh, out uh, food waste could save 4.4 million tons of CO2 emissions, which is quite a lot. Implementing a blockchain supply system creates a fair supply chain, which relieves pressure on farmers and discourages overproduction. And uh, next slide, slide, please. For those of you that don't know what blockchain is, it is a digital uh, re record keeping technology with great potential for using supply chain uh, management acting as a distributed ledger. And blockchain offers decentralization and removes the need for the middleman. And uh, how it works is that blocks are uh, comprised of digital information uh, describing day, time, monetary transactions and product codes. And uh, to add uh, a block to the chain, uh, four events must occur. Transaction, verification of this transaction, uh, transaction information is stored then, and hashing of the block, encrypting the information with a uh, function. Uh, next slide, please. So how can blockchain be used uh, to solve the, uh, these inefficiencies? Uh, it will give many benefits to the business itself, cost effectiveness, efficiency, transparency, traceability, and security. These improvements plus more will keep uh, SMEs ahead of the curve with regards to technology. At the very least allow them to remain competitive with the supermarket giants, which is really what we're looking for. So how will this uh, uh, translate environmentally? Also important part. These may not be initially obvious and have a more longer uh, term focus, uh, which I guess is not uh, very business orientated, you know, uh, economically wise people wouldn't be happy with this. Nevertheless, it's important. Uh, prevention of food waste is the biggest potential benefit and utilizing blockchain attacks this issue for multiple uh, angles, communication difficulties, inaccurate forecasting, tracing of potential food contamination. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, as you can imagine with all novel technologies, there will be uh, teething problems. 
lack of awareness and the knowledge of the technology. Um, a lot of people are not aware of it. I mean, you know, this will obviously progress in the near future as well. There is an unwillingness to utilize daunting and potentially confusing. Anything new, as you can imagine, can be a problem. Questions of regulation need to be addressed. And uh, the supermarket convenience and low prices will be difficult competition. Convenience is a very difficult competition in all respects that I can think of. So this is no exception here. And uh, I believe this was the last uh, slide. Uh, now you can ask questions about this. I won't be able to answer them because it's uh, my presentation. <laughs> You never know. No, no. Thanks, Theo, for doing a good job here, indeed. But indeed, the real, the real honor is with the team that's put it together. I remember when we had the discussion, and indeed, the Q and A session is off, uh, is open because we might be able to also feedback any response back to the team. I remember when we had the discussion among the judges, we strongly felt that the obesity issue is one of the pertinent drivers for additional health challenges related to the pandemic. So the food system itself will have to change. And indeed within, it's also the role of consumers and the supply chain. And seeing that so many hackathons really look at technology and IT solution, we thought this is a interesting, a good a contribution to uh, starting to apply blockchain technology to some of the uh, market mechanisms and food chain. So we thought that was really well done. There has been a question here raised by Ian again. Thanks. Uh, Theo, would you like to read it? Yes. Uh, how can data be integrated through all links, stakeholders and supply chains, some of whom are competitors? Uh, it is a good question. I would say, Theo, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you have an answer. I think it's a key question, definitely. It is. And one that also came up in our uh, while meeting with the judges, uh, there's also a huge question about well confidentiality and uh, who owns the data. Is there any GDPR issue uh, that indeed uh, sensitive data can also be potentially misused? So there's a lot in it. Uh, but we may just leave it here for the time being. Uh, trying to draw a connection to the first presentation, I think the behavioral issue is, again, here in the air, it is quite important to not only look at the behavior of the end consumer indeed, having a more healthier diet and incentivizing or nudging the people to have different diets, but also look at the behavior of shop owners, behavior of people in the supply chain. And we would very much think that in a combination of some smart technologies, taking into account GDPR issues and those nudges towards behavioral changes, we should all together be able to transform our food systems. Uh, I see some nodding. So I suggest we come to a close here of this meeting. Thanks again to all people who participated in the Akerson, who presented today. I was really pleased and impressed by the depth of your thoughts about how a transformation could work in a particular area. I would certainly, seeing now also lots of people from UCL around here, encourage all winners to contact others from the faculty, from your departments. Don't be shy. You really have done a terrific job and it's definitely within the spirit of UCL that we typically have always a good idea to also proactively reach out yourself, introduce yourself, uh, share your thoughts and your presentation so that if you yourself have an interest to go a step further, well, do a next step. Um, I will also try to facilitate. We might be able to reconnect with you in like three months or so when you might either be moving on with your own career or might have had a chance to have a feedback. And if then the door is like occasionally open, I'll be happy to uh, help with the maneuver of going through that semi-open door. So I look at 
myself a bit as a facilitator and I'll certainly be happy to help you facilitating bringing your ideas well closer to citizens so thanks again thanks also from people any other last word Theo uh, I would also like to uh, thank them for uh, participating I mean they're the ones that make up the hackathon their ideas were excellent and uh, hopefully they will continue with uh, you know pursuing uh, these ideas and uh, make them uh, a reality why not and if we can help in any way hopefully you know this was the first step of this and uh, good luck with this and with your uh, studies whoever is still studying and uh, yes that's it so thanks a lot the recordings the q and a should be available so there will be a follow-up and i again wish to say thank you keep in touch and uh, have a great afternoon and stay safe all right. Cheers then. Bye.